I know you're gonna dig this. This is Ryan McGlynn, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles, recorded live here at DATV Studios in Dayton, Ohio. And now, my studio guest is Dr. Scott Brown, professor, UCLA African American Studies, author, and music historian. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, we're happy to have you here on, on our show, Funk Chronicles. And by you being a historian, and we are trying to promote the Funk Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center, and knowing the history, we think it's so important that mm -hmm. folks understand and know the history of funk. So, I know that you've been doing research on this, mm -hmm. so why don't you just start talking to us about your research, what the funk means, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm excited. Tell sure, me about it. Sure, sure. Well, go ahead. As, as you all know, funk is so much more than, than a four-letter word. Uh, it's a genre. It's a style of music. It's a fusion of so many different histories of sound that comes together. Uh, it's a part of the migration of sound. We think about the folk that came to Dayton through the 20th century. They brought ideas and cultures and styles with them here. Uh, and so that fusion that you see in funk tells a bigger story, a bigger story of African American history than that's really uh, the center of my work the book that I'm finishing now is called Tales from the Land of Funk, tentatively titled, Tales from the Land of Funk, Dayton, Ohio, the self-contained bands of Dayton, Ohio. So when you think about funk and you think about rock and roll, you think about soul, you think about gospel, there are a lot of ways that certain sounds get attached to time periods and also different social conditions. So the blues gets attached to the Great Migration, the Mississippi, movement from the Mississippi to Chicago and other places. We think about soul music and rhythm and blues. A lot of that is tied to the social movement known as the Civil Rights Movement, where we derive so many of our anthems. What I have found is that there's a jump from soul and R&B right to hip hop. Suddenly people will say, yeah, well, hip hop comes out of the lack of arts education in the schools, the lack of places for young people to congregate, and they created this. So that's where I come in, because as a young person growing up in Rochester, New York, I played bass guitar in local funk bands in Rochester. So I said, well, wait a minute, there isn't the extensive conversation on the scholarly level about funk in relation to social conditions as has been the case with these other genres. So that's where um, it turns out that my three, uh, three of my probably five favorite bass players came from Dayton. Marshall Jones, Mark Adams from Slave, and Marvin Craig from Lakeside. So I always wanted to know what was going on with this city that produced all this funk. And so when I started researching it, Personally, in the early 2000s, it just snowballed into a project that is hopefully a book that's uh, going to be finished soon. So when you think about, what would make you think that 
Dayton mm -hmm. has been the cradle mm -hmm. of uh, funk. What What do you think? You know, Dayton's also been known for inventions yeah. and create. What is it about do mm -hmm. you see here in Dayton that really was the the cradle of creating this funk? Well, you know, the term funk and references to funk with respect to music go back even to like New Orleans, uh, juke joints, uh, dances. Juke so there's joints. a way that the con conceptually it's been around a lot longer than the period at which the, we kind of think about the funk golden age as of the late latter 1970s. Uh, or maybe, maybe the, for the most part, the 1970s. So Dayton, Ohio has a lot of the same kinds of conditions that we see elsewhere that I sort of map out, and that is the availability of relatively high-wage working-class jobs, so parents can afford instruments, uh, a large African-American community that is migrating from the South, Right, and the development of a very strong black public sphere. What I think is special about Dayton and special about maybe one other uh, Midwestern city that's known for having its own sound, it's not a big city, Minneapolis, is that at the high point of their musical careers, the Ohio players stayed in Dayton. They didn't leave to Los Angeles. They didn't leave to New York City. And so what that does is it allows them to mentor, I mean, so many of the artists that I've interviewed, and I've interviewed over the past two years more than 100 artists uh, and people related to, to the Dayton story, the Ohio players are sort of like an institution. Uh, and you have other institutions, bands, local bands, like Big J. Bush and the House Rockers and others, but the Ohio players really were that vehicle. You can see somebody driving around in a Lamborghini in your town that is on albums, it's going off on tour, you can see the end product of that kind of hard work and dedication right in your midst. You can't say that for a lot of other small cities, smaller cities. So if you take, for instance, my city, Rochester, New York, we've had groups that have done well, but they've left and they weren't sort of an institution there. And so I think that's a big kind of, you have what we call in history, the lamppost syndrome. So when the light shines on a dark street, there's a lot of other things in the street, but you can see what the light is shining on. And I think what the players were able to do was shine that national light and also mentor so many other artists afterwards. That's, I think, a very, very important variable in the distinction of one city or another uh, in terms of knowing about uh, the rich histories there. I often ask my students the question, what if Prince never got the record deal with Warner Brothers, with Orrin Husney? There would still be Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. There, there'd still be all those bands there. And so if that's the case, think about how many other stories and cities all over the country that are not told in part because of some of those dynamics not happening for them. Hmm. Yeah, and because, you know, they, when you were saying that, I was recalling the fact that Lakeside stayed here. Uh, they lived here, Lakeside. Yeah. But they, I mean, they're not as well, famous they, as... But well, they went to L.A. See, they, Lakeside left and went to L.A. and became really a tremendous live performance force in Los Angeles. They, and, and it's so funny because... But I, and I guess the reason probably why I, I would say Lakeside is because I knew their parents. Oh, yeah. And, and so yeah, I yeah, could yeah. see their parents. I could see them when they came home. Yeah. And so... Um, mm -hmm. but, but the fact is that these groups never really denied No, Dayton. that's true. And, and yeah. so I think that played a role also, yeah. would you say? Uh, sure, I think they never denied it, but also building institutions here. So if you have, oh, like the Troutmans, like the, Troutmans, oh, yeah. like the Ohio players, so that the idea that, and that doesn't happen in a lot of smaller cities. So for instance, um, the neighboring city to my hometown, Buffalo, New York, where Rick James is from, you know, we didn't have that same kind of sense that oh, you can go to Buffalo you know, make some connections and that could launch your career. There are so many stories of artists here who 
uh, I was told a story uh, by um, an artist who said he went, they, they were kids and they decided to go over and knock on Sugarfoot's door uh, and asked about if they could get a string for their guitar. And that turned into a whole relationship of mentoring and teaching. And he, he did that even to the day that I interviewed him. Uh, when I went to Sugarfoot's house to interview him, he didn't really want to do the interview. Uh, he was in one of his moods, but I, I had interviewed um, Sammy and Earl Reed, the Blues Reed brothers. And so they called Sugarfoot and said, you need to talk to this man. He came all the way out here from L.A. So begrudgingly, he accepted the interview. I get to his house and he says, I got a question for you. I said, what's that? He said, do you play anything yourself? I said, uh, yes, sir, uh, I'm a bass player. He said, where's your bass? I said, uh, actually, it's in the car. I happen to, you know, bring it with me. Go get it. So go to my car, go get the bass, and, and uh, he says, plug it in. So I plug it in. And at this point, he had had his stroke already, so he had taught himself how to play keyboards because he couldn't play guitar. And he told me, actually, if he knew keyboards were that easy, he probably wouldn't have picked up a guitar. You know, that, and that's so much of his own musical genius for him to just learn an instrument that way. So he says, can you play skin tight? And of course, that was the, that's sort of a standard for bass players. So I go into it, doom, 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 doom. And he's like, okay, can you do the change? Can you do the bridge? So I go into the bridge, which is a scale. Ba -da 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 -da. He says, okay, we can do the interview. If you keep practicing, boy, you can make you some money one day. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but those were the kind of pearls that I've been able to get from this kind of uh, long-term project of telling the story. And it's one of those things that you kind of, ha I have to put the brakes on myself because I can keep on researching. And st I mean, it's taken me to newspaper periodicals like the Jetstone News, Harvey oh, Simmons. Oh my goodness. All right. I used to write for them. Yeah, I, I have seen, as I have seen, I think yeah. I may have sent you some, some poetry or something you did. I mean, that, oh, that may have been the Dayton Express. Yeah, I, Was that the Dayton Express? Might have been. Okay. Uh, it's taking me to periodicals like the uh, Boy, you bring it back Dayton Black there. Press. That's another yeah, newspaper. Yeah. Uh, uh, Pride Magazine. Oh yeah. 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 So so really to I tell the story. You have some of those magazines. You have some too. of those. See? Yeah. So to tell this story it really requires a kind of discipline and pulling together so many different sources. But what I hope will come out of it is a whole thinking about funk in relation to community, in relation to the kinds of things that we're trying to rebuild through efforts like the Funk Center. You know, we're trying to rebuild those kind of connections that people forged. That's part of what made the funk circulate uh, in the black public sphere so that there's a teacher like a uh, Mr. Spencer, you know, who's able to chaperone young people as they go into different establishments. He's organizing talent shows for them. Those are all about relationships and community. And you can't have a lot of those things without rebuilding that kind of community infrastructure, and that's what I see the Funk Center doing. Yes, and I, you know, and I, can, I can imagine uh, with you doing this service, with you doing this research, that that you're going to have your go back to the breaks because it's so fascinating, mm -hmm. and each story leads to another story yeah. to the point where you got to figure out, okay, where do I? stop here That's right. and, and put it all together and make it interesting for folks to want to read. So maybe in the process of mm -hmm. doing all of this, it might be sequels, you know, you could do That's a little right. mini, don't mm -hmm. kill, I'm, 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 as, <laughs> a, as a um, person who loves all of this, mm -hmm. but I, don't kill me with a 400 page book. Right. Yeah. So, so, you know, it, it probably would be good to do it in sequels. Mm -hmm. You like a shorter read that pulls you and in. Then, and then I'm waiting for the second yeah. one and then the third one. Yeah. And if, we, if I look at the book and I'm looking at my time scale, Joe, and I'm going, I can't, right. I can't tackle 400 pages. To, mm -hmm. And, um, uh, but that's just a, because this topic is so interesting. It is. Yeah. And it's so fluid. It's so fluid. There's so many rich avenues to go to. And I, part of my challenge was 
I have all of this data that I've amassed. And so then you have to think about how you're going to organize it. Is it going to be based on the groups? You can almost tell the story. You can break it up around schools. That they came could, from, yeah. Yep, Roth, Roosevelt, Dunbar, Dunbar. you know, even Colonel White and uh, Chaminade, you know. Um, you know, you can organize it that way. You can organize it chronologically. You can, so there's all those things that come, and it's a discovery process. I'm thankful to say that I kind of have now um, a pretty set idea about how I'm organizing it, and, and it doesn't overshadow all of the pearls of wisdom from the oral history interviews that I've done, because that's what I think brings the voice of the people. You know, in so many fields in the academy, we look for theories to help understand social reality. And what I find about uh, this project is to have tapped into the wisdom of the folk. The people theorize very well about their own experience. And so I see my role uh, as somebody who's sympathetic to the art form, somebody that elevates and exposes all of that genius that's at the community level. Sometimes folks that we don't even know about that are central to making history. History wouldn't happen without them. The unsung sheroes and heroes. I always That's right. talk about them. The, absolutely. Because they're there and we stand on their shoulders to to be able to, to, to shine. And sometimes they're forgotten, but if it wasn't for them, well, some of us wouldn't be who we are today. That's right. So the the you know person that works at the community center that organizes the battle of the bands at the community center, the person that gets the show wagon together in the parks, all of those people are people that create the cultural framework for us to get what we get. And so it's very easy to just think about the end product, which is celebrity. But you've got to talk about Big Jim Caldwell. Oh right? my goodness. Who managed yeah. the majestics? You've oh, got you've oh got to my, you've yes. got to bring all of that into the tapestry to get the story. And so that's sort of the angle that I've come from. I've been very blessed that the community, most all the I think that they were open to somebody not being from here working on this project, in part because they know I am such a funk fanatic as a musician. Uh, I got a chance to meet, uh, for instance, Mark Adams, and you know I would talk to him on the phone. I'd play his bass lines, and he would crack up laughing at how I had that stuff note for note, you know. And so he would say, "You almost there, brother. You just just keep practicing. You, you, you're doing all right." But the point is that because of the kinship of the music, I've been able to have access. And um, that, I think, speaks to the spiritual power of the funk, because funk is a show and prove genre. You've got to be able to not just say it, you've got to be able to play it. And it's, it's the kind of environment where something like the Battle of the Bands, you connect that to funk, because if you can get on the stage and play, you've got a seat at the table. And I think in my own way, I function like that in, in, in engaging the Dayton story. You know, I, I think uh, uh, as I've interviewed um, M Michael Jackson, well, I'm gonna put, I call him mm -hmm. affectionately MCJ, you know, he talks about how it is a, 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 a movement mm -hmm. with, that you can do, that he can touch all these people just by the art of what mm -hmm. he does. Yeah. And, and, and I think that the passion that you see from folks, even when you know, I interview a, a, a Donald Payne who uh, played with Junie Morris. Right. And, and when you hear about Junie and uh, th this young man Payne telling us about them being young, and you hear the prince uh, what we hear about Prince, right. but but Junie was on the same order of oh, meticulousness, uh, of uh, professionalism, mm -hmm. uh, it, that they're uh, just yeah. so, you know, those who, who make it, those who don't, but but do in their own sure, way. Sure, in their own way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just like with Prince being in Minneapolis, you know, that Prince was... Um, 
But Prince was also, like the Ohio players, like Roger Troutman, part of a community. There's a, there's a history in Minneapolis, of a strong history of jazz. Both of his parents were in a jazz band. Um, you have the group The Sounds of Blackness. Yes. That was a group that was started in the early 70s uh, as a collective that came out of McAllister College and were like a community institution. And they're still around to this day. So it's very easy to think, and this is where I'm pushing a little bit in my work. One thing that celebrity does in terms of when we see a figure in a national light, we think about individual genius. And individual genius is very real. No one can deny that. But I also want to talk about these artists in the context of what I call community genius. That there's a deeper story. If there wasn't a Mrs. Anderson, Andre Simone's mother, who took Prince in, when he was moving from place to place, you might not have had that outcome. So how do you tell the story in a way that people like Mrs. Anderson gets the kind of due status? And that's when I talk about the community genius. I talk about these kind of ties that we have that ensure that another group of people can move forward. Well, and especially like in Dayton, you know, you, you, there's so many people in Dayton can give you stories about the Ohio players. That's right. Uh, I mean, where they lived, how they saw, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I mean, they were touchy, feely, they were community. Sure. And I, I think that's, I, I agree with you, that that what makes the difference. Whereas in a, L.A., they get lost in the mix. Well, see, L.A. is a magnet for people who come from other places and Often, I mean, there is an L.A. story of black L.A. that often is overshadowed by the kind of Hollywood focus. But also, I think cities that are sort of magnets for artist migration, they bring to that city all of the ethos. So, in, for instance, when uh, I spoke with a number of members of Lakeside, they felt like when they performed in the circuit in L.A., they knew they didn't have any competition on their level because the terrain that they had come out of as a show band, they felt was not really on their level. So when they come out with the choreography, the Ohio Lakeside Express and the steps and the showmanship, the movement of one song to the next, they felt like, well, the competition wasn't really on their level. So... Uh, I think New York probably could get something like that, particularly when people, a place that people migrate to. Uh, even when we think about soul music and Motown in Detroit, there was a moment where artists actually wanted to go to Detroit, right, to get on to Motown. Uh, and so uh, that's the difference between, I think, a city with a major record label. And that's how we typically think about cities. We think about the record label, so say Memphis and Stax, Philly and Philly you International. You know, one time Cincinnati had a record yeah, label. Yeah, King Records. And, yeah. and I think that was, didn't sure. James Brown have sure. something absolutely. to do with that? absolutely. King yeah. Records, yeah. yeah I remember, you know, absolutely. When you drive down Cincinnati, mm -hmm. when you were driving to, to Cincinnati, you could look over there yeah. and you could, you could see it. And yeah. You could, uh, yeah, and I think, um, you know, there were attempts at a label here, Air City Records in the 80s. And a, a lot of smaller independent labels that artists recorded on, but the lack of, let's say, a, a, a major label is part of how the story of Dayton has sort of been hidden from the public view. But that's where they that's hire where, folks like that's us to where intervene. Dr. Scott Brown comes that's it, in. That's yeah, it. yeah, that's where you come yeah. in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and you do, because I remember the label uh, of King down mm -hmm. in uh, Cincinnati. Yeah. And I mean, it was, you know, that was one of those proud moments when you would drive, you know, you riding down with your parents in the mm -hmm. highway or some friends, and you could point and say, yeah, yeah. Uh, James Brown owns that. You know, That's or, right. Or, uh, so, but that was also um, a sign that between Dayton and uh, Cincinnati. Cincinnati about the music. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and so that was a prime place to be. That's right, Cincinnati, uh, and also, you know, you've, and, and everything in between, right? Everything in between. Uh, Hamilton, <laughs> you know, where uh, Greg Webster and uh, the Troutman family and Sugarfoot, you know, are from. So there's also a way of thinking, you know, musicians don't see these boundaries 
in in the way that a political map would show. Mus musicians move all over inside a city from neighborhoods that other people wouldn't go to and between um, and regionally. And so that's another way of thinking about telling the story, the story of Dayton as also part of the wider Ohio and then wider Midwest story uh, with respect to R&B, soul, and funk. You know, and it's interesting that when we talk about uh, the funk, the Midwest plays a, a, a serious mm -hmm. uh, role That's in, right. in, in this uh, arena. Absolutely. A very serious role. Um, something about mm -hmm. the Midwest. And Maybe is it, you think it, could, could it be the Mississippi, being that the Mississippi kind of flows through the center and then it's tributary, you know, those routes that people are taking, right? I mean, we tend to think about the Mississippi as this kind no, of the Mississippi uh, where it starts cultural, up, cultural starts highway. Where does right? it start? Up there? In uh, well, it comes out right out through Louisiana. You no, know. I'm talking about coming down. I mean, feeds, uh, I'm what's the river that feeds into the Mississippi? For, for, uh, for the Mississippi? The Ohio River? I'm trying to think. Mm. When I was in college in Iowa, we always had the sandbag. Mm. <laughs> uh, because when 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 you know when winter broke and spring, all the snow mm -hmm. be melting down, and I, yeah. I can't remember, but we yeah. would go in sandbags. Sure. Um, but I think yeah. that was to miss it. Yeah, it, it goes up the middle. So typically, we have this coastal view in the U.S. about culture. We think about the big cities on the coast influencing the center, but actually, a lot of African American art, culture history and music story is the center branching out. So if you, for instance, you take the, the television show Soul Train, mm. right? Don Cornelius starts that as a local show in Chicago, and then it moves to Los Angeles. And of course it taps into a lot of local um, dance and music that comes out of LA as well. But there is this way, this interaction between the centers and the coast that's ongoing. It's not so much to say one is more important than the other, but there's definitely a multi-directional kind of exchange uh, as artists from different cities want to get their message out. Many of them migrate to other places. But don't you think also that the Midwestern flavor mm -hmm. uh, helps to generate the community wherever it goes? Well, I think that when I, Midwestern flavor, I think about not the Midwest per se as a geography, but I think about social conditions. Well, so I'm, when I think about, for instance, like um, Newark or Plainfield, New Jersey, where P-Funk is formed in a barbershop, yeah. right? Those are the kinds of conditions that we see in working class towns and communities where People congregate, you know, a whole bunch of uh, funk musicians here talk about being friends beforehand on the Little League team, the first yeah. Dayton Little League team. So it's really, I think, a question of, while the Midwest is, is ripe with so many cities and towns like to have those kinds of institutions, my eye is on those relationships. Uh, and. Bigger cities like New York City have them too, but they get obscured, whereas I think industrial towns uh, are a big part of this story of funk. And, and I was going to say that because when you think about when I, when I was talking about the Midwest and flavor, mm -hmm. I said flavor. You described the com community or where mm -hmm. the connection of relationships. We're saying the same thing, okay. but I said it differently. But mm -hmm. the other thing is, is that because of the uh, industrialization period. Yeah. That folks worked hard mm -hmm. and they worked in what I would consider a mundane or drone of a job. Mm -hmm. So music and mm -hmm. entertainment yeah. was the outlet. And so yeah. I believe that because of that, mm -hmm. the creativity was, was driven because this is the one place where I can uh, express myself. Mm -hmm. I can have talent. Yeah. I can, I can, I can I explode with where I've been just doing this and this. And so, you know, from the church, and, and most of mm -hmm. them started with the church because sure. the church was where you yeah. got a chance to 
do something different. Right, and that's what and you often developed and were introduced to your craft was in church. So I, I think you're absolutely right. The other part of that is um, working class conditions, but also, and this is not to romanticize segregation. Oh, no. I'm not going to romanticize segregation, but there was a period where there are lots of black businesses, lots of black owned establishments where people congregated. And in that period where you have an ebony club, where you have a Tahiti hut, you have these institutions where young people congregate, live bands were a big part of the soundtrack to that sort of period of time, particularly uh, in the late 60s and early 70s. Well, I mean, my dad had yeah. the, uh, the new Farmdale. He had mm. uh, yeah. um, George Tuck had mm -hmm. the Lavender Lounge. Right, right. Um, so, uh, and uh, you, you had all of these different, well, we had Lakeview Palladium. Lakeview Palladium, yeah. So we had all of these uh, venues. And they were black owned. Many of them were black owned. They were black right? owned. And people lived near them. So that's also a function of, when I talk about community, it's where people socialize in the areas that they live and they have places that they actually respect. So it's not like, oh, like this term we use now, the hood. Oh, it's a little hood spot. Oh, no, 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 no. This is a neighborhood spot, and you're gonna put on your Sunday's best. And this and is our community. Do, this is our community. And and yeah. one, one of the, the the things that you said that I really do believe is that segregation. And I and I, I uh, when we integrated, we lost community. Right. And we lost our entrepreneurship. We were forced to be entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, because of being segregated. Mm -hmm. um, it was really not um, when I went off to college in Iowa that I was I was used to seeing black mainly black business people mm -hmm. from my dry cleaners to my store owner to to mm -hmm. the gas station mm -hmm. I was used to that it was right. a whole different world going to to Iowa mm -hmm. uh, and seeing white people in those jobs that I saw black people do. Sure. And this is what gets into when we talk about. Uh, I mean, you have black doctors. Sure. I mean, you have black physicians. You yeah. Know? So integration really, uh, d in many forms, hurt us. Well, see, this is why I, I use a term that Eugene Robinson uses in this book. It's, we don't get integration, we get disintegration. Meaning that there isn't a two-way movement of resources. So even with school desegregation, Roosevelt High School had something special to offer. Uh, Roth High School, of course, has something special. To, all those black schools had something special to offer, but the, the, lo the logic was the black students here will be better served elsewhere in terms of the national logic of busing. Rarely have we ever articulated, well, wait a minute, white students who are not able to experience a Mr. Spencer are missing out. So there's something special here that should also be a magnet. It shouldn't just be a question of, you know, close the school down uh, and, and move people here. There's something special that we've developed uh, in our day and time that should be as much a part of the standard. And I think that what some of the teachers that I've interviewed lament about desegregation was the loss of that special dynamic that they had a relationship to students and it has everything to do with the funk because so many of the funk musicians that we talk to talk about music in the classes, arts education, and relationships with teachers. And if we go back to the basics, and mm -hmm. the basics would be schools would have been integrated if housing was integrated. Mm. And, and mm -hmm. what happened was the buses took, took, took the African-American children out of their community right. and took them to a foreign community. Mm -hmm. So therefore they lost, that's when our communities lost connection because the kids next door whom they used to know because they walked to school with now they mm -hmm. don't know anymore because they're going to different places well i think that's why with where we are now the intervention of the funk center 
And efforts like this are very crucial because I talk about how jobs and schools were part of making funk happen. Now we have to take the funk and rebuild and create jobs and institutions of education like the Funk Center. So it's a very, very weighty challenge, but it's, it's one that I think we're up for. I, d I do too. And, and we talk about community and you always have to give credit to David Webb with the vision to, yes, to, absolutely. to, to, to keep pounding it and bringing people like you, Dr. Scott Brown, on and the continuing uh, the legacy for us to have a Funk Hall of Fame That's right. with an educational. Uh, it's very important that mm -hmm. the educational component yes. uh, be uh, be there so we can continue the legacy yes. of what we are in the sense of community. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you. This is Ryan McGlynn, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles. Until the next time, Keep it funky. You know what I think heaven is? I think heaven is you. You know that? Thank you.